Rangers fans, welcome to Liberty Blue, the essential New York Rangers podcast. I'm Andrew Chelney, alongside Nick Zararis. And Nick, the dream for this year is is no longer alive. The Rangers fell to the Florida Panthers in six, and now they have to watch as the Panthers face the Oilers in the cup final. There's no good answers. It's that straightforward. I said it Saturday night. I, I came on here and walked through the five stages, the 12 stages of grief by myself just to kind of talk it all out. And it wasn't supposed to be like this, man. This was the best Ranger team in 30 years and still wasn't good enough to even make the Stanley Cup final. Put that in the proper context of where the Rangers are in history of the league, where they are post 2004 5 lockout where they've been, the opportunities they've had, the players they've had. This is not a bad team. The problem is they have continually run into great teams at points where they did not keep the game close enough, where they might be able to pull off that upset. That That's the key. We, we talked about it before the series started. Carolina, very similar to Florida in terms of the mechanics of how they play. The problem for the Rangers was, Sasha Barkov is a real killer. Yep. Carter Verhage, Matthew Kachuk, Sam Bennett, Sam Reinhardt, those are real killers. You know, Jake Gensel's a good player. He's not Alex Barkov. And that's the difference here. Against a, le- a team with lesser high-end talent, the Rangers have found ways to survive getting outplayed at five-on-five five as dramatically as they have. The Rangers had no business getting to six games against the Panthers. If you go look at the metrics, they're in the 30s, the low 30s. We said their formula, the best chance they would have, if they could keep it above 42%, they would have a good chance of upsetting Florida. And then you combine that with the power play just getting stifled for three straight games, you're out. It's that straightforward. The recipe is simple. Goaltending, special teams, passable at five on five. The only part of that they had was goaltending. If it weren't for Shesterkin, they're out of there in five games, maybe even a sweep. The Rangers are a good team. They ran into a great team. There is no shame in losing to a team that's better than you, but it is awfully unsatisfying that everything it took to get here is for naught. I was disappointed. Oh, there's a lot of things that we could talk about, but the the one thing I want to point out, because you mentioned that the power play that didn't get going. Yeah, a lot of it had to do with the Panthers just had a really good system. And I want to also credit the Panthers. Like, they were really good. They had a great, a really a solid, solid series against the Rangers. They were in the offensive zone for a lot of the time, a lot of the time. Like they, they, the difference between them and what Carolina did was, yeah, the Carolina hurricanes had a lot of zone time and they threw 98 shots of the net. They were all at Strickland's legs, but the Panthers, not only did they have the puck in the offensive zone, but they moved so quickly and so often that it, just made the Rangers uncomfortable a lot of the time. And that really killed this team. And part of it was because there were injuries that led to the Rangers not being, they were never the fastest team, but you take a look at the power play where Adam Fox was so badly injured. He, he really couldn't move when your power play quarterback can't move. That usually means that everybody else on the ice isn't moving as much either. And when nobody is moving, that means that the passes are very predictable. They're very readable. Oh, Adam Fox is at the point, and he's not moving enough, so nobody else is, so he's going to make this pass. They're going to try to force this cross-size thing and, you know, and, and, and this and that. And that's really their only plan be- because no one else is moving and therefore making the Panthers penalty kill uncomfortable. Yes, the injuries were bad. I really wish a, we would have seen some kind of change on the power play. Put Lafreniere at the first power play unit because he was so hot the entire playoffs. He was on one. His confidence was sky high. Make Gustafson the power play one quarterback and make Fox the, if you want to put the defenseman out there because you don't trust, you know, Gustafson. Play Zach Jones at all. Play Zach Jones at all. Like, yeah, I mean, we, yeah, we talked about it before game six. Like, there was just not enough changes that, and and who's to say that these changes would have made any difference? We don't know. We no one can say definitively whether they would have or whether they, whether they would not have. But I would like to see them at least because the things that they did in those six games, for the most part, did not go well. So you would expect 
there'd be more experimentation, more efforting to try to find something because through six games, you got dominated at even strength. Your power play dried up. Your penalty kill was okay for the most part. Yeah, there were a few bounces that went off of legs and whatever it went, and then you can't really really do anything about that. But I would have liked to see more effort to try to find something as opposed to... They needed more wrinkles. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, as opposed to here's here's the best that we got. We're going to keep trying to fit the square peg in the round hole, and maybe eventually it'll go in. That was kind of their plan for some parts of that Florida series, and I, I just... It, it, it obviously didn't go well. The last power play goal they scored in the series was Panarin skating to the bottom of the right circle and setting up Trocek for a one-timer in the high slot. They needed more wrinkles like that. They needed to give Florida different looks, and they weren't there for the most part. And I think the issue that starts there and also happens at 5-on-5 five five is they don't want to get hit. They don't want to go to that low net front area where you're going to get slammed. And... I understand I'm not volunteering myself to go into Gustav Forsling with my head down. I'm not. But the Rangers' inability to get to the net front is part of this issue. The Rangers fundamentally, as an offense, only get to the net front if they're able to create off the rush. If they are able to spring from defense to offense quickly, gain the zone with speed. And then we get further into that. You go and look at some of the decisions in that game six of where guys are choosing to shoot the puck from, who in general is choosing to shoot the puck. And you got that, you felt the panic. When you have guys like Lingren and Truba and Schneider leading the team in shots on goal, you can tell there's some antsiness, there's some discomfort, and a glimmer of, and not a glimmer, I should, not even a glimmer, real desperation that, all right, we got to get pucks on net by any means necessary. That's great and all, but without traffic, Bob is going to make all of those saves. That was the issue here. The Rangers did not find a way to make Florida have to really work defensively. Florida was able to get their defensive posture and say, okay, break it down. And the Rangers are not a team that is going to cycle. They are not going to go high to low. They're not going to point shot. They're not going to battle at the net front and look for deflections. They're not that type of team. And that's what you have to do if you want to beat a team like Florida that's big, that's physical and imposing. And because you needed to take pressure off your defense. The Rangers played entirely too much defense in this series, and their offense didn't do them any favors with that. Sometimes, yeah, you might be able to get a shot from 25 feet away, but you miss the net, Florida recovers, goes back the other way. The amount of one and dones in this series ultimately led to their undoing. The Rangers were never going to win this series with the amount of defense they had to play, and it took a superhuman effort from Shesterkin to keep it close. And I know a lot of people have been making a big deal of the goal differential in the series was really close. There were all these one goal games. Yes, the games were close. All it took would have taken was one more bounce for the Rangers in some of these games. You know, I said after game six ended, all they need is one power play goal in one of those three games they lose. And it's a different series. But you cannot lament the fact you lost. You lost. It's over with. You can't change what already happened. And I know a lot of people are already rushing to the the fantasy trades and the Brady Kachuk stuff is mind-numbingly stupid already. But talking about the team as it lays right now, they are a good team. Sure. Finding a way to get to that next tier, to get to where Florida has been the last two years, that's the goal. How do the Rangers bridge that gap? There aren't any clear-cut, oh, this person is there, let's do this. So yeah. it, it it means the Rangers are going to have to get creative and they are going to have to make really difficult decisions. And we have an entire summer. Hell, we have an entire month of June before we can really start tackling pet projects and ideas. But tying a bow on the regular season, tying a bow on this iteration of this team, the flaws were not that bad in the regular season. You compare this year's team to last year's team, There were none of the glaring, oh my God, what the hell is going on? There is no Jake Bunch of numbers for a month and a half. There is no Ben Harper for four months. The Rangers came into this season with a clear-cut understanding of what did not work last year. Did all of their ideas work? No. Nick Benino got waived. Blake Wheeler was very ineffective before he got injured. Gustafson worked. 
in the regular season. I know Gustafson was not anybody's favorite the way he played in these playoffs, but if the price is right, I would be open to that, and there's plenty of time to talk about that. But Gustafson represented an understanding of what didn't work last year. Instead of Ben Harper or Nico Mikola, we opted for small, puck-moving, offensively inclined in that 6th spot. That represented an understanding of a mistake. Quick, they've been on the back, the backup goalie carousel for a while. They got the right one. They get credit for picking the right one. That's not necessarily a learning from a mistake because Halak sure. wasn't terrible last year. But that's the key here. What do the Rangers take away from their season? And that's ultimately one of the few ways we get an honest account of what they think. GMs, coaches... They are very reticent to tell you anything they actually think because they don't want to tip their hand. The only time you get a real understanding of what they are thinking is when they have to make decisions. Take, if I'm sitting down right now, my biggest takeaway is we need to get faster and we need to get better on defense. Spare me yep. the Brady Kachuk, the Mitch Marner. Yes, would those guys make the team better? Yes. Sure. You are going to have more... I don't want to say direct or translatable. It is a lot more practical to say, let's change up our defense. Let's overhaul our defense because we have three years of evidence now that although the six guys they had, so Gustafson, Truba, Schneider, Miller, Fox, Lindgren, those guys individually all have strengths. They all have weaknesses. Some of them are better than others. On an individual basis, those six guys should comprise a functional NHL defense. They did not. So let's unpack why it did not work this year. Let's unpack why it didn't work against the Devils. Let's unpack why it didn't work against Tampa two years ago. I think until they address the defense, talking about whether it's Kreider, Zabinijad, Panarin, whomever you want to blame up front, I don't think it's fair to critique the offense until they address the defense because they play so much defense because their defense does not play good enough defense. It is that straightforward. I would love to see what this offense could have looked like with a better functioning defense. No, I mean, you're totally right. I do. I mean, you, you know, you still can put some blame on the offense for just their inability to, once they're in the offensive zone, sustain it. Like, but at the same time, when you're in the, when you're defending 70% of the time, that's a, like, that's a glaring issue that hasn't been fixed for years now like oh no I, to be fair to be fair a little bit better than this a little bit better they're usually in the 40 to 45 percent of defense 30 sure. percent is 30 percent you're 30%, lucky to be in the game that's that's bad yeah 30 yeah. percent is really bad but you take a look at how it's not it, you know florida is a really good team and they kept the rangers in the in the defensive zone sure but you watch how they did it you really have to deconstruct how the Florida Panthers essentially skated circles around the, the Rangers blue line. And part of that was, yes, Fox was injured and that was a big problem. Maybe I would have to imagine that Lingard was also injured and that also, you know, is not, e that's not, that's not easy to recover from when the team that you're playing against is fast and physical. All of that can be true. But at the same time, you, this is not a one year thing. The Rangers blue line has been porous for multiple playoff runs in a row. So at a certain point, Chris Jury has to sit down with the video department, with the scouting team, with everybody that he employed, you know, under him, employs under him, and, and really just have a week long process of, okay, this is our blue line. This has been the blue line for the most part, for the better part of the last few years, with this with this current playoff core iteration that's been growing through the gamut the last few years. It has not worked. Year in and year out, when it gets to the playoffs, our team is stuck in our own zone. Our blue liners aren't doing as effective of a job as they can slash should be slash, you know, anywhere that you want to insert here at getting the puck out of our own zone and transitioning into offense. What can we do to fix that problem for next year? That might come with growing pains that might come with difficult decisions that might come with a regular season that maybe isn't, you know, record setting as this, as this past season has been, but if it translates well, come playoff time, then that's all that matters. If you lose, if you lose five extra or seven extra games in the regular season, but you get to the playoffs and you are playing much better. I'll take that. So talking about the issues, number one, Talented players don't necessarily mesh together. 
I think the Rangers have enough understanding now over the last two seasons in particular that no matter how good someone is, they might not compliment what their partner does. And I think this is why a lot of people are sour on Gustafson after the series and these playoffs in particular, because they were asking him to babysit their worst defenseman. You cannot ask a puck-moving offense first defenseman to be responsible for the, the work of two guys. You know, it's just, you did not put Gustafson in a position to succeed asking him to babysit Truba. There, there is no world in which that was going to work out. The decision to reduce Truba's workload, in theory, by moving him down, he still ended up with the second most minutes of any defenseman in the series against Florida, which I don't know how you're playing on the third pair and end up with the second most minutes, but we can nitpick the coaching decisions because there are a few I wanted to talk about later. But as far as the mechanics of the defense, in an ideal world, you would have a defenseman who is both mobile and good at moving the puck. Sometimes you have to pick one or the other. Sometimes you have to pick, do you want someone who is big or do you want someone who is able to move the puck? The Rangers opted for guy a little bit smaller and able to move the puck in Gustafson. The problem is you put him with Truba, who does not understand his job is to get the puck to his partner. That is the issue here. No matter who Truba plays with, he is taking it upon himself that, no, I'm the guy who get I'm the guy who has to make the play. He is the his skill set is the retriever. His skill set is, I'm going to use my body and my skating to win the puck, and then I'm going to get it to my partner because my partner is the puck mover. Truba still thinks he's in Winnipeg playing with Dustin Bufflin. He still thinks he's playing with Josh Morrissey. He does not understand his role and what his functionality is at this point in his career. He needs to make better decisions. The inability for Truba to make good decisions is part of why they are here right now. If Truba made better decisions, even though he is a diminished player in terms of what he used to be, with Winnipeg, he was genuinely an effective hockey player. His talent is different now. He's a little bit slower. He's a little bit older. He doesn't get the quarterback of power play. He doesn't play on a first pair. He's got fewer minutes, so his counting stats look worse. You add that with a little bit slower foot speed, and he's not going to win as many puck battles. And because he's throwing himself all over the ice to try and win these pucks, he's consistently putting his partner in a position to play two-on-ones. Did Gustafson screw him over on the two-on-one? Yeah, Gustafson's got to make a better angle on that first Florida goal in Game 6. Sure. 100% no disagreements. Yeah. But Truba can't make that decision. No. You cannot, in good conscience, tell me that was the right play. No. You can't. You cannot tell me. It was first disgustingly of, bad. First of all, number one, did he think he was going to get an offsides by hitting the guy who didn't have the puck? Because that's what he went to do. The only way that makes sense in my head is if he's trying to get Bennett to be offsides before the play even happens. But even still, he pulls up and doesn't hit Bennett so he doesn't get the interference. But in doing that, you are leaving your partner alone to defend a two-on-one. You are leaving your probably the worst defensive defenseman on the team in Gustafson to play defense because you went for a hit you didn't have the facilities to make. That's the issue. He does not make the right decision because he is not, he's just, frankly, he's not thinking. He is not thinking these decisions through. Yep. And you can tell me it's a split second thing. It's not a, a, th a thought thing. It's a reaction thing. It's um, an Your instinct. first reaction is to chicken wing instead of playing a 2v2 and to make it a 2v1, then I don't, then you need like, you, you got to get back. You, you can't, like, you can't do that. No, but you can't. You're not, you're like, Trouba is not an 18 year old rookie playing his first playoff game. This man is what 29, 30. Like, he, like he's he's been around the block. He's like, been paying this into is not his, his 401k for a while. Like my my man's has been here for a good minute. The fact that he, if you, if the argument is it's a split second decision, my brother, my brother, like you've played hundreds of games. Thousands. It's a two v two, and your first instinct is to try to chicken wing somebody and you miss and now it's a 2v1 going the other way in game six of a playoff game of the conference finals dude what are we doing here like and, and it's 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 just such a maddening thing to to keep saying because it's it, it's not like this it's is years the first of this. time it's years of this it's, it's four it, years of this it'd be least. one thing if, if you know if it, gradual decline if it was well, one a gradual decline sure but two if it was uh like an out of character thing for him of like oh you know he tried to make this play i can kind of see what he was doing but it didn't work it led to a two-on-one that's one thing 
my man's does this practically every game. And the fact that he keeps doing this is really just, it, it's disheartening because I'm sure I could bet my my house on it. You could, I'll, but I'll bet your house on it that the coaching staff have sat him down in front of a in front of a TV and have walked him through the things that he cannot be doing. I I will bet every penny I have to my name that Peter Laviolette and his video and his and the video staff and the coaching staff have sat him down, played him a bunch of clips of him doing that, and told him please stop doing this, and he continues to do this. So it, it just, it, it really angers me. It baffles me. It disappoints me that these things keep happening. And I don't, I don't know what the solution is here. Uh, we'll get to that. Don't worry. There, there, there are plenty of solutions as to how to uh, amend the defense. Uh, I don't think I can accurately ascertain what Miller or Schneider is because of their roles and their responsibilities. I do think I can definitively say Miller needs to be more consistent. I think yes. having a better partner would help him with that. I do feel like he consistently has to take on maybe a little bit more responsibility than he needs to, but the tools are there. And sure. I don't want to make this direct comparison because they're not similar in terms of the traits they have, but I can very easily see Keandre Miller, if it doesn't work here in New York, having a Brady Shea type, another team puts together his traits and puts him in a role to succeed type thing. Because it really feels like the Rangers just kind of threw him into the deep end of the pool three years ago and said, you'll figure out defense, you're playing with a good defenseman, and you get enough experience, you'll figure it out. And I definitely think Miller is an NHL player. I don't think there's any dispute that he sure. is an above-average NHL player. But if the Rangers are going to get where they want to be, he probably has to be either Fox's wingman on the first pair. I or think that's the... Long term, I think that's the answer. Or he needs to be the number three shutdown guy. He needs to be the, I'm trying to think of the, the Ryan McDonough on Tampa Bay type deal or the Ryan Ellis on Nashville. Yeah. Or but the Josh Morrissey on Winnipeg. The, the the difference being that Kendrick Miller has real puck moving abilities. He does. Which, which is why I would argue that he'd be better with Fox because like in, instead of instead of the third pair, like if if your defense is so good, no, I'm not saying third pair. I'm saying third defense. I'm, you I'm know, sorry, one, I'm two, sorry, three, I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, yeah, third defense. But like the thing about Kandra Miller is that he is really like when he is feeling it, you can see the confidence in both the way that he defends and both and and how he attacks the net with the puck. We've seen. It, I I agree in terms of I I would love for him to be more consistent because there's been time there's been stretches throughout the season the playoffs where he's been incredible and then you then there's the next few games or the next few shifts where, you, where you're and you watch him play and you're like what are you doing brother like what is happening so one I really would like to get him more consistent too I I think him being with Fox is going to help everybody involved Lingren just. I, he's going to be. We're going to get to Lingren. We're going one by yeah, one. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get to that in a second. But I I would like to see Miller and, and Fox. I think that could really work because they have skill sets that complement each other, and Miller can do both if need be, and he he's shown the ability to do that when whenever he, essentially whenever he wants. Obviously, there's a you know there's a line to it, but if you give him a little bit of a leash to go out there and be on the top pair and make the plays with one of the best defensemen in the league in Adam Fox when he's not skating on one leg, I think that's a pair that could really work. I think the argument ultimately becomes, do you have a guy you can put with Fox that's either going to maximize Fox in a way that is complementary, you know, kind of what Lindgren was when he was healthy, what their impacts were maybe two years ago, three years ago, as opposed to what they are now. Or do you want to distribute your two best defensemen? Because I think that's the logic. I think in my head, the reason they haven't played Miller with Fox is they want to separate them in the same way they've separated Panarin from Zabinijad over the years. That you want to have your talent distributed throughout your lineup a little bit better. I think if they are able to acquire a defenseman 
who can play better with Fox or somebody who can take that Miller spot to play with Schneider. I think there's no argument here that Schneider's usurped Truva on the depth chart. I don't think there's really an argument that he hasn't yeah. other than the assignments they've been given. But in terms of quality of play, I think Schneider, even though I do think Schneider needs to improve on some things, he's definitely played better than he definitely played better than Truba in the regular season and in the postseason. I agree. So moving along here, talking about the first pair. Fox was really good in the regular season. I want to say yep. he was fifth or sixth in the league and standing points above replacement for all defensemen. Outside argument to be a Norris candidate. You get the knee on knee from Jensen in game five, a uh, game five of the no game four game of the four. first round. Mm-hmm. And it really derailed his season, his yep. postseason. He only finished, I want to say, five points in the entire playoffs. Somebody mm-hmm. who was a point per game player when they went to the, the conference final in 2022, somebody who has shown you an ability to rise to the occasion in difficult situations against high level competition. And I'm not going to say he gets a full pass, but he gets a decently sized pass sure. for his performance in these playoffs. I think Ryan Lindgren is the first real inflection point of this offseason because there's never going to be an easier time to cut the cord as a Mm -hmm. restricted free agent. I think you can absolutely get a useful asset in return for him as a 26-year-old restricted free agent. Yes, he has arbitration rights. I think the Rangers, I think ultimately what they do with Lindgren is kind of going to define what happens, kind of like how three years ago when it came time to either trade Zabinijad or give him the extension – they married Mika Zabinijad. They they could have broken up. Those were the choices. You get married or you break up. There's no we keep dating. That's where they're at with Lindgren now. If you give him the long-term deal right now, and I know technically they could do a one-year thing and get him to unrestricted free agency, but I don't think that would make a lot of sense. No, from a, from a, the Rangers would not like to do that. I, I don't think from a frugality perspective, yeah. just because they don't have a lot of money and they have, frankly, bigger fish to fry in the not-too-distant future. And it's also easier to trade him now than yes. it would be a year from now. Yes, 100%. I think that's your first real inflection point of the offseason is Ryan Lindgren's status. I think the Rangers... I'm not ready to definitively say they've learned their lesson. I do think they I do think they are more willing to understand when they've made a mistake. I think the fact that they were able to trade Sammy Blay within 36 months of acquiring him tells me that at least they understand we can't be sentimental here. I mean, this is the team that bought out Henrik Lundqvist. I don't think you can afford to be sentimental anymore, especially at this point. Ryan Glingren gave you some amazing hockey genuinely one of the real blood and guts heart and soul type guys but there's a reason the rangers never won anything with dan girardi and mark stall yep it, it, it's just that straightforward you cannot pay guys for what they have already given you unless you've won something if you're washington you can give tj oshi an eight-year contract at 31 you won your stanley cup that's yeah. fine the rangers are in a position where they're going to have shesterkin in his prime for maybe three to four more years you have to do everything in your power to maximize that, and you'll figure out the rest. You know, Z- Panarin's an unrestricted free agent in two years. Tro- Trub is an unrestricted free agent in two years. Zabinijad and Trocek are here forever, but the rest of the team, you know, the clock's ticking, and you're going to have to hard reset in two or three years when those guys all start to come up. And Lingren is your first real opportunity to get some flexibility. And that's not something the Rangers have had in recent off seasons. Last year, they had no flexibility. It was all league minimum guys. Yep. I think this is the, I don't want to say it's an easy decision because very clearly he's valued amongst his teammates. And that's really, that's the hard part here. The Rangers just had their best season in franchise history. And you're going to have to tell some of these guys, I'm sorry, but your friends can't stay. Your friends, you know, the sleepover is over. You got to go home now. The party's over. We need to be better. And that means tough decisions because Lindgren is the type of guy in an ideal world. He's your third pair lefty. He kills penalties. But once that first con, once he has to actually get paid money, he's never going to be worth it because he's never going to put up the counting stats. That's the thing with paying defensemen. Unless you have the Bouchard, Fox, Quinn Hughes, McCarr, Paying them anything more than four or five million dollars a year is going to hamstring you. I think that Chris Drury, because he was around Dan Girardi and Mark Stahl and those guys, I think he sees a lot of Dan Girardi in Ryan Lindgren because of the 82 game a year cyborg warrior blocks a million shots a game, all these things at 26 and maybe the thought process is oh he's still 26 he can you know he can 
get better and things like that. But I think Chris Drury has been there, done that with guys like this because we're essentially just doing the same thing over again. We're doing the exact same thing the Rangers did 10 years ago with Lundqvist, they, where they had Girardi and Stahl, and they would have these they would have the offensive pieces that just that did not do enough come the cup final, come the conference finals, got shut out a couple of times against the, the Lightning 2015. Like we're doing the same thing. We've watched this movie before. Lundqvist standing on his head, carrying a a, a blue line that didn't deserve to be there and an offense that was anemic at times farther than than the Rangers deserved to be all you know masking a lot of the problems that this team had and here we are once again where Shesterkin is absolutely unbelievable standing on his head bailing the team out save after save and you have Dan Girardi or Mark Stahl on the ice doing Dan Girardi or Mark Stahl things, but ultimately they're just not good enough to get the team to a cup win. We're doing the same thing, and I would hope that Chris Drury, you know, he's watching this movie with different cast members, and he's thinking to himself, oh, I think I know how this, I think I know how this ends, and I don't like the way this ends. I should change, I should change the script. I need to change the way that this movie goes. Because if I don't change what's written down, we're going to see the exact same thing with the exact same processes, with the exact same sentimental value that gets us nowhere. I would think that Drury, because he's been around the block, because he's he was part of the part of these teams, that he would understand that, okay, you know, Ryan Lingren gave us a lot. He was somebody that never backed down. He was always, always playing through gashes and, and injuries and all these things, but he's 26. And if he's already breaking down now, I, he, he cannot in good faith, give him a long-term contract. And if you're not going to give him a long-term contract, then he, it's no, there's no easier time to move him than now when he's an RFA. So the one caveat I will give you is like you said, Lingren is going to be turning 26 at some point later this year. It's – no, excuse me, 20, February of next year. But they give Girardi and Stahl their contracts when they're 30. I know there is going to be a contingent, a non – I won't say a majority. There will be a very vocal contingent that is going to pound the drum that you give him a four- or five-year deal and then you walk away. I don't think you can afford to do that just because, like we've said, the miles are real – and he's frail, just objectively speaking. He's played through a lot of injuries, and you see the effect of him playing in a compromised state. The only I, way you can justify that is if you completely revitalize your blue line and have Lindgren be on the third pair. But I don't see that happening. So it, it, like, it, They've been very reluctant to take yeah. him away from Fox yeah. for whatever reason. Yeah. And it's not like he compliments Fox all that much. That's the weird thing. It's not like he does stuff that Fox doesn't do. Sure, Lindgren's going to be the one that puts his back to the team that's forechecking and move the puck to Fox. There are a lot of left-handed defensemen they could find to be puck retrievers to get the puck to Adam Fox. And that's ultimately the goal here. That you, aren't as broken and are yeah. probably going to be less expensive. Or if they're more expensive, they give you a little bit more. Yeah. You know, if Lindgren was consistently giving you points, if he was between 30 and 40 points, okay, I think I'd be a little more okay with talking about money for a defenseman. Sure, sure. But if you give defensemen who don't give you points money, you end up in trouble. I mean, that's the inefficiency with the Truba contract. If Truba was getting paid half of what he was getting paid, it wouldn't be a good contract. But it would at least be bearable. Yeah. The Rangers gave him that contract on the premise that he was going to be a 50, 60 point defenseman and that the cap was going to keep going up. They didn't realize they were going to luck into one of the best defensemen in the entire league a year into getting him. That's the issue. Now, wrapping up a bow on the defense, there are a lot of guys out there that people are going to throw around as their names. The one thing I will say, I, I have not done any research. I haven't looked into availability, pending trades, whatever. Just be aware that the Rangers have tried this a lot sure over have. the last few years to find guys in free agency who are good. The problem is the Rangers have brought guys in who are good because of the situation they're in. 
I've seen more than one person suggest Jalen Chatfield as a trooper replacement. Let's not take the impacts of somebody who plays in Carolina and assume those are going to translate to New York. They are not. On and no, I think Chatfield is an interesting idea. I don't think I want anybody who plays in that Carolina system. And I know Trocheck worked out very well for him. The responsibilities he has playing with Panarin are very different than what Jalen Chadfield would have. And that he's right-handed, which kind of throws the problem they have already into the mix. But there are plenty of possibilities. Just you are not going to fix your problems on July 1st. You're not. You can help your team. You're not going to win on July 1st. You know, we, we talked about this last year and the year before on July 1st. You can't win the Stanley Cup on July 1st. You certainly can lose it. Oh, yeah. You certainly can oh, lose yeah. it on July 1st. You know, I, I still I'm still believing the only reason they signed Patrick Nemeth is that that was the agreement to get Nils Lundqvist to come over from Sweden because there was no way that was going to work. I mean, watching his t- Nemeth tape and looking at his numbers from those playoff series in Colorado, he was playing with good defensemen and getting his doors blown off. I don't understand how the Rangers saw that and thought it was going to work here. Okay. Transitioning to talking about the offense, we've been talking about the defense now about a half hour. The forwards are good. The problem is they're not great. The other problem is they're married to some of these guys. Oh, yeah. Them and Mika Zabinijad bought a house together, got married at 24, and are very quickly realizing, oh, I'm only 24. I maybe didn't have everything figured out when I picked this person. And yes, Mika Zubinijad is really good. He's really good. He's the 19th, 20 best center in the entire NHL. That's fine. Sure. To win the Stanley Cup, you need one of the five or 10 best guys in the league. Andrew, you ready? We're going to rattle it off. Jack Eichel, Nathan McKinnon, Steven Stamkos, Braden Point. Then then Ryan O'Reilly's kind of the weak link here. You could say Zubinijad's maybe better than him. Nick Backstrom, Sid, Sid. Ryan O'Reilly is a much better two-way player. Yes. Zabin- yes. Listen, Zabinajet plays defense, and he does it well sometimes. Ryan O'Reilly is a really good all-around player. Yes. Sid, Sid, Taze, Kopitar, Taze, Kopitar, Bergeron, Taze. Mika Zabinajet is not on the same level of any of nope. those guys. The only one he's close to is Ryan O'Reilly, and that took a Blues team that had one of the best defensive cores of any team that's won a Stanley Cup in the last 10 years. That's the bar here. You are not going to win a Stanley Cup if you don't have one of the best. You look at the two teams that are in the Cup final right now. Barkov and McDavid. McDavid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd take, uh, I'd take either one of them over Zibidija. That's, 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 but, uh, you know, I'm not breaking any news here. Barkov, McDavid, and then Dreisaitl. And then, you know, sure, Sam Bennett, not a true 2C, but you still got Verhage and Reinhardt and Kachuk, so it balances out. The, we did the analogy when before the Washington series. If you lined everybody up like it was gym class, you know, you put the Rangers and the Panthers on the line. The only two Rangers going in the first few picks are Fox and uh, – not Fox, excuse me – are Panarin and Shesterkin. And then after that, you're going to be sitting a while with an injured Adam Fox, you know. Barkov is one of the five, ten best players in the entire world. That's the thing here. Can Zabinijad sniff that again? I think that two weeks at the beginning of March in 2020 is going to be the peak of his NHL career. I really think that was the peak of his NHL career. He has had yeah. some incredible regular season moments. He doesn't have a signature playoff moment. He doesn't. Nope. Sure, he had a two-goal game against Carolina two years ago to get them to a game seven. That's great. That's all he's got. Mm -hmm. Continuously, when the Rangers have needed him and Kreider to get something going, they haven't been able to do it. Florida said, okay, if you're going to beat us, somebody other than Panarin, Trocek, and Lafreniere, and God bless them. They were still good in this series. Panarin, Trocek, and Lafreniere still had reasonably solid impacts and gave the team some goals. Zabinjad and Kreider's inability to break through offensively is that's the thing here, man. You're going to need at least two lines giving you offense consistently. And then that third line's got to give you offense every now and then. I'm not going to get on Wenberg and um, Kako and Cooley because the Florida guys are better and they their game is not going to translate to a ton of goals. Wenberg had the fewest scoring chances of like anybody in the entire playoffs. He just doesn't shoot. The Rangers are a good team. To be a Stanley Cup winning team, you need greatness. And I don't think greatness is capable 
from the guys they have. I just don't. I mean, I would tend to agree, especially with Zabinajad. I mean, it's it's tough because he's a good player, especially me. Like I've maligned him all season long on the show, on Twitter. And it's it's one of those things where it's like, I wish I was I wish he proved me wrong. Like I would love it. It's I, I would love for Zabinajad to to, you know, to spit in my face and say, oh, yeah, now say it again after scoring a big goal or making the big play that led to the big goal or something along those lines. I would I would have loved to have been wrong and, you know, shouted from the rooftops about how great Zabinijet is and all these things. Like, when I highlight the, the negative aspects of Zabinijad's game, I don't do it with a smile on my face. Same thing with True Butts. Like, I would love for these guys to be excellent performers, and if they were excellent performance, performers, they probably would have made the final, And but they're, you know, but they're not, and, th- and they didn't make the great plays, and so here we are. And it's just, it comes down to Zabinijad, and he just never had it at 5-on-5 five five in the regular season, and uh, you know your your ears bleed every uh, because I've 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 mentioned it so many times throughout the course of this this season. He went thirty games without a five on five goal. He didn't have much in the way of five on five offense in the playoffs either. And it's like okay, well if you can't get a five on five offense going against insert ra- random team in the regular season here when teams may not be you know like they're they're preparing for you sure, but they're not preparing for you in the same way that the Panthers were in the conference finals. If you can't get things going against some random team in December or, or February or whatever it is, then how well, not January. You... Zabinija didn't have a five on five yeah. goal in January. <laughs> That's right. Like, how can you get it done in May? How can you get it done in June when you can't get it done in January? That's that's the question that Drury has to ask himself is, okay... Well, he doesn't have a choice. He's married to Zabinijad. No, there is no... I, I, I'm, I understand. on the team, he's yes. probably the single most immovable. I, I completely... Yeah, he's got a no-move close until 2030. Like, my man's is here, and he's not going anywhere. But the, the question that you have to ask yourself is, okay, well, if he's here to stay... And he's proven time and time again that he uh, he is not the guy. He's not him. Come May, to to put the team on his back and you know and score the big goal or make the big play. Okay, then what as a team do we have to do to make up for that? Where is the offense going to come from when you're? let's say second line center, because, you know, Panarin, uh, Trocek, and Lafreniere play the most minutes. When your second line center, who makes eight and a half million dollars until the, the, you know, the sun explodes, uh, isn't doing much of anything offensively come the playoffs. And, you know, we talked about this at the trade deadline, and I want to mention it now. The circus of maneuverability at the right wing spot on the first line where we talked all year about how VZ was a placeholder in the, in the top six. Blake Wheeler, a placeholder in the top six. Kaka was there for a little Kaka while. Kaka was there. They tried a whole bunch of different people just to just to kind of be like, okay, you're there for now. We'll fix it. You know, the deadline, uh, it'll, it'll be fine. And I understand why Chris Drury didn't, empty the cupboards for a guy like Gensel, especially if they, you know, they, if he loves Gabe Perot so much, if he loves these other guys so much, like to a certain extent, I get it. Jack Roslovic was awful. Oh my God. Was he awful? It, it, it was one of the worst trades that I've ever seen in, in, in the regards of we're bringing in this guy to be the first line right winger. And he is going to be one of the leaders on this team to bring us to the promised land. He was so bad that he barely saw ice time as, as, as the Rangers got closer to the final. He was so bad. He didn't generate any offense. He, like, I don't know what he was that, doing. That's not his, uh, the problem is they brought him in to be something. They brought him in to be the engine, to do transition stuff and to give Kreider and Zabinijad a functional guy who would be able to get the puck to them and then occasionally drift into open space to be open for Zubinijad. The problem is Zubinijad and Kreider get hemmed in their own zone a lot. They don't break out cleanly. They 
do okay when they are able to get stuff going in transition, but they're not cycle guys. They're not link up guys. And because of that, Roslovic's only real plus is his skating and his shot. You saw the shot in the in the first round. He was really good against Washington. And then after that, once teams started to realize, okay, if we can make him be the difference, he's not going to be able to be the difference. The Rangers for three years now have been trying to find a first line right wing to complement those two. Ever since the trade, they've yes. been trying to fill it and it hasn't worked. Yeah. Oh, th- because I, they- I for what I'm, I'm shocked by this, by this uh, whole ordeal. They did not understand what they had, and they have been trying to fix that problem for years. If you add up the cap hits from the guys they brought in that first offseason, you could have paid for Buchnevich to stay. They opted for three depth guys, two of which are no longer in the organization, one of which is no longer playing hockey in the National Hockey League, and then the third guy they couldn't give away last summer. Uh, Goudreau, I'm a little more inclined to get, to not crap on because he was good in the playoffs but i do think if they're the opportunity his, his shot percentage yeah it's like 40 shot percentage heater was an incredible sight to see like the 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 yeah, austin matthews a, of 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 the playoffs was, was of the eastern conference crazy. final yeah uh, i mean that was that was insane but but yeah it's it's tough because like some people will will look at that and say oh you know gujo i don't want to say exercises demons because he still wasn't a great player outside of those goals but at he the had same the lowest time, shot share of any player in the entire at the playoff. same time he was one of the few players that actually did anything offensively so i'll i'll give him a pass on this one so speaking more about just the offense in general part of the problem is a they don't get to defense they don't get from defense to offense quickly enough and then number two their style of offense does not translate to the postseason it, it's that's the most glaring issue and that's been the case for four years I wrote a column in 2020 after they lost to Carolina. They are not going to be able to beat good defensive teams off of the rush in the playoffs because the average playoff team plays better, more structured defense, and has more talented defensemen. This You have three years of evidence now that you can't win with only this. If you cannot maintain offensive zone time, cycle, and create offense the ugly way, you are not going to be able to score enough. The Rangers averaged two goals a game in the series. They finished with 12 total goals through six games. The Oilers are averaging over three and a half per game. The Panthers are averaging three point, I think, one per game. If you want to win in the playoffs in today's NHL, you need to score at least three goals a game. If you want to do that, you're going to need some more offense at five on five. It is not a coincidence that the Rangers record when they don't score a power play goal in the playoffs over the last three years is something like three and nine. They do not score enough at five on five. When the power play doesn't score, they don't have enough opportunities because in the abstract, they are not creating enough volume to give themselves a chance. That's the biggest issue. They don't need to become the Hurricanes, but they need to get enough offense that they are not on defense the entire game. And so that it's not only up to Kreider and Zabinijad off of the rush. You know, the one goal they combined for in this series was an odd man rush where they broke free on the penalty kill and Kreider was able to score with someone draped over his back. When they have to gain the zone, either through contact or dump it in and go get it, they're not going to go get it. That's the issue here. Until the Rangers accept the way they want to play is not going to work against better teams, we're going to keep doing this over and over again. And the thing is, the reason the Rangers won't change is because they'll say it worked in the regular season. They will say, in the long run, it works. We just got to get to the long run. The problem is a playoff series is not the long run. You only need to win four out of seven. That is not the long run. The beauty about the playoffs is small sample sizes where your 82 game stretch against, you know, every team in the league that isn't watching hours and hours of tape on you and breaking down every little thing that you do, like they do in the playoffs, it's a little bit easier to get away with things. Like, okay. Yeah. The video team short, like, well, obviously give give the head coach and the and the staff notes on tendencies and how to beat you and etc but they're not spending hours and hours breaking you down because they know they're playing somebody else could be in 24 hours after you so they're not scouring through so you know gigabytes and gigabytes of data trying to figure out 
you know, how to how to beat how to marginally beat you in the regular season. They're not doing that, but they are doing in the playoffs. So everything that you do, all of your tendencies, all the things that you like to do are expanded to a, to such a an, an insane, insane amount in the video room in the playoffs that if you don't find a way to adapt, if you don't find a way to say, okay, clearly we got away with not being the best five on five team, the regular season, but Oh, it's okay. We'll get, we'll get through it in the playoffs because it worked in the regular season. Like that's not the, that's not a good mentality because the playoffs are such a different beast compared to the first 82. You have to be a good team to make it to the first through it through 82. Sure. No, obviously no one's denying that, but you have to be a great team, not just a great team, but a fundamentally solid team to get to the Stanley Cup final. You have to be a team that understands how to limit other cha- the other team's offensive abilities while promoting your own. The Rangers throughout these, you know, the few few years now have done a really good job of st- just staying alive for 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 dear life at 5 on 5 and then hoping that they're at the other team that the reps will call penalties and that they'll score on the power play. The problem with that formula is as we saw, as we talked about earlier, when Adam Fox is playing on one leg, your power play dries up and that goes a lot of your offense. Okay. So now you can't score on the power play and you've already given up essentially the, the effort to creating a five on five offense. So if your special teams aren't doing it and your five on five isn't doing it, Shesty can't score goals. I know he has tried in the past, but he cannot score goals. The same way that Lundqvist cannot score goals. Like, your goaltenders are standing on their heads to to get you to this point. You need to support them with better defense and more consistent offense. Before any of that happens, we can, like, you can argue, you can yell at the wall. It's not going to help you win cup games. It's frustrating because then you start to get into the people's motivations and what the stakeholders actually care about, which is, you know, there's no way to know. Are the Rangers content with just being a consistent playoff team and then continuing to roll the dice come the playoffs? You know, you asked earlier, why didn't they go in to Jake Gensel? Because they don't maybe they don't think they they don't think they need him. Maybe they think they just need to roll the dice enough times and they can break through. Maybe they accept that maybe they get one more good crack at this. Then two years from now, you try and figure out if you're going to keep Panarin. You figure out what you're going to do with, uh, not with Zabinajad, excuse me, what you're going to do with Lafreniere, what you're going to do with Keandre Miller, what you're going to do with Shesterkin. And then you start to orient the team around Fox, Othman, Perot, Trocek, Zabinijad, Lafreniere. Like, that core does not sound nearly as good as this one, and there's a lot of risk riding on the Rangers' ability to translate Brendan Othman and Gabriel Perot into consistent NHL players and ones who are ready to make an impact relatively quickly. I was very skeptical of the Rangers' unwillingness to unload one of, if not. I don't know if they should have done both in one trade for Jake Gensel, but I think if you add Jake Gensel to this team, you're going to give them a little bit more, and... There's no way to know. It's it is purely just for conversational purposes. But sitting here now, after being eliminated in six games, you damn sure would have rather had Jake Gensel there than Jack Roslovic or Filipito, who hadn't played in six yep. months. You know, the Rangers did not do themselves any favors. And one more thing before we kind of wrap up, just the first, I had no real complaints with Laviolette once we got past about. December. I, I think the lineup really calcified then. Sure, Wheeler on the first line was stupid, but we all knew that was a holding pattern for an eventual addition. It's really rough that his first real rough patch was in the Eastern Conference final. Yep. Continuing to roll four lines evenly with eight minutes to go down two goals is negligence. There is no planet in which Goudreau, Kako, any of those guys should have been on the ice with five minutes to go. There is no world in which Gustafson and Truba should have been getting regular shifts with five minutes to go. There is no world in which you should be giving Matt Rempe, Barkley Goudreau, and I forget who the other, the, I think Blake Wheeler, fourth line offensive zone starts in a game you are trailing. I think that was game three, no, game four, excuse mm-hmm. me, that was game four. There's no world in which you should be giving those guys offensive zone starts down a goal late. You need offense. You can't be burning offensive zone starts on guys you have to baby. 
You need to be doing whatever you can to maximize your offense. And it's really frustrating that the first real nitpicks and complaints come in the biggest games of the year. I mean, I'm going to say it again. I said it on Saturday. I said it last Monday. How can you see what Edmonton did bringing in Broberg and not at least – I know Jones skated, but like – Yeah. You could have played Jones the eight minutes that you were playing Rempe or whoever the 12th forward was. The Rempe stuff, whatever, he's not the difference between the team winning and losing. The the ninth through 12th forward are not going to be the difference between the Rangers being what they are right now and getting over the hump. Sure, teams have added guys to their bottom six and subsequently gotten improvement and gone on to win Stanley Cups. I know. Every single time there's any conversation about Barkley Goudreau or Pat Maroon, I know. Believe me, I know. I watch the games. I read the columns. I listen to the podcasts. I know. Those guys are not the difference between winning or losing this time of year. The winning and losing is defined by the great players. The Rangers have one definitively great player. They have two who are occasionally great. If the Rangers want to get into that upper echelon and win a Stanley Cup at some point in our natural born lives, they are going to need to find that one more guy. Until they do that, we are wasting our time. Until we do that, they are grasping at straws and hoping for the right permutation of factors to go their way. That's why they're chasing this intangibles bullshit. That is why they are chasing the magic secret sauce of this guy won, this guy's been a captain, this guy's been an alternate captain, this guy's been to cup finals. The reason you chase the the intangible, the undefined, is because you know you can't improve your roster that much. Mm -hmm. So you have to do whatever you can on the margins to try and get more out of them. And yeah, they did get more out of them this year. Absolutely. This is the best regular season the Rangers have ever had. It was not enough against a great team in Florida. Until the Rangers accept they are not good enough, we are in a holding pattern. That is what we need to understand this offseason. Does the front office understand the group is not good enough? Because according to what they tell us, based on the fact they didn't go get Gensel, that tells me they thought they were good enough. Yeah, it's it, it all comes down to what they think is going to be the elixir to this problem. Uh, I would have to, I mean, like Chris was, was up there in the GM suite watching the games. I would have to imagine that he saw some of the, the biggest issues of this team that were the big issues last year when they got embarrassed by the devils, they got, that they got in, you know, sort of embarrassed by the lightning and like, you know, I, I get they were ahead of schedule, but they still had a, a two nothing series lead in the conference final. And then they blew that all of the issues that they've been having are the same issues. This has been the same set of problems for multiple runs now. So, okay. You tried to fix it in 2022 by getting Patrick Kane, who was on one hip and Lo and behold, they didn't do much of anything for you. So now this year, you swing the pendulum the other way by going, we don't want any big names at all because we're so good in the regular season that it doesn't matter who we get. We're going to get Wenberg, who by all accounts was a, a good addition to the bottom six. But Jack Roslovic was supposed to be slotted in as the first line right winger, and that backfired so tremendously badly that I am interested to see what Drury does now because it's not like that first line right winger spot is now going to be filled by somebody definitively. That hole is now bigger than it has been. That hole, it was big in games one through six of the conference finals, and now it has exponentially increased. Now it's all a matter of who is going to be the guy that is going to take that spot and run with it. Until we get that guy wearing red, white, and blue for this team, none of this matters. I also, I know I've seen a lot of people saying it, more than one person has said it in the comments as we've been streaming. I'm not bank- banking on Brendan Othman coming in and scoring 25 goals next yeah. year. Yep. Let's let's just call, let's just be realistic. Could he do it? Sure. Sure. I would be a lot more. Be great I, if he did. I would expect his production to be a lot closer to what you saw from someone like Cooley, where 10 to 15 goals, maybe 35 points at most. He's going to have a rough acclimation process. 
the Rangers are not very kind to the young, their young forwards. He's going to probably end up playing on the third line. He's going to end up on a line centered by Filipino more likely than not. Do not expect the young guy to be your savior. You are putting the kid in a position he will not succeed in. Uh, other than that, now we wait. That's the biggest thing. We still got a solid two weeks till the draft, three weeks till free agency. We got a whole week till the final start. I cannot believe the year the Rangers would have actually had an advantage in the Stanley Cup Finals the one year they really kind of missed their opportunity. You know, the Oilers had 10 shots on goal last night and got through to the Stanley Cup Final. The Oilers are a really good team, but they're not astounding. They're not the deepest group. They have two of the five best players in the world and one of the five, ten best defensemen in the world. You get past that, I mean, they've just got some quality depth, an occasionally good goalie, Mm -hmm. and this was the year, you know. This was it. This was it. You were never going to have a better opportunity to win the Stanley Cup than this year, Mm -hmm. just based on the path you had to take where you got to beat up the worst playoff team in the history of this format. You beat a division rival in six games, and you lose a playoff series where the goal differential was two over the course of six games to play a team who has a goalie whose save percentage was below 900 coming into the conference final. You were never going to have an easier path to winning a Stanley Cup. Now you have to stew on it, and now you have to think on it. I don't know what the Rangers think their problems are. Once we start getting glimmers of movement, once we start hearing the rumblings and getting ideas, and this is for everybody out there, remember who is telling you what they are telling you and why they would be doing that. Nobody is saying the Rangers are interested in Brady Kachuk. Everybody is saying the Rangers would like Brady Kachuk because we all see Brady Kachuk is good at hockey. He is big. He is strong. He's a miserable prick. He is something the Rangers do not have. There is no credibility to Ottawa shopping him, being interested in trading him, or the Rangers being interested in trading him. Breakup day hasn't happened yet. Exit interviews have not happened. Tomorrow, 11.30 a.m. It's always interesting to watch. I will make a point of trying to glean, trying to gain what I can. You know, that's really where I felt Gallant had... Really, I really kind of knew Gallant was going to get fired. I knew it took like four or five days after that for them to go through with it, but that was where you got an idea. I'm really curious to see how Truba is. I'm really curious to see how Kreider is. I'm really curious to see how Zabinjad is. I was left wanting more with the post-game comments, both after game five and after game six. It's great you had great chances, man. But to not admit some culpability of we weren't good enough, Mm -hmm. I just... It doesn't mean a whole lot. I don't take those things particularly seriously, but just give me a little validation that I'm not the only one who's upset here. You know, I I know they care and they have to keep a facade, but at some point, I just want to know you're pissed off too. Tell me that you know you needed to be better, that you missed your opportunity, because these chances don't come around all that often. They've been to one cup final in my 27 years of existence, and they lasted five games. Yep. God knows if they're ever going to get there again. It's really the thing. All I want is one, man. All I want is one. And, you know, we're both 27. I was, we were not alive for 94. Uh, All we want is one. The videos are great. I'm done with 94 documentaries. I I just, I can't listen to the comparisons anymore. I can't listen to the stories anymore. I can't sit there and watch Mark Messier on the TNT panel or the ESPN panel, whatever panel he's on and have everybody else that's on the panel, ask him 19 questions about the 94 run and and whether or not he'll promise they'll win tonight. Please. I'm so over it. I'm so over it. Just give me one. That's all. That's all I'm asking for. And then I'll be the guy in the stands with the, I can die in peace sign. That's all I want is one. Give me one. That's the thing, man. You look around this league, one cup since America entered World War II, and there was a period there where there were six teams in the league. They have real soul-searching to do. 
if they run back a pretty similar team, maybe some tinkering on the margin, somebody else in the Blake Wheeler spot, maybe someone else in the Gustafson spot, you're not really going to do a whole lot to endear yourself. I think based on how, and I know social media is not the most accurate reflection. It took three full seasons, but I think people realize now that Truba is not worth defending anymore. It's taken close to three full seasons. Yep. I think people realize Gaudreau is massively overpaid. It's taken three full seasons, but I think people realize that Zbigniew contract was not a prudent decision. I think a lot of people, if you gave them the mulligan, would have said, by any means necessary, you trade for Jack Eichel and we'll figure the next thing out. Yep. I, I, I am not doing I told you so because it is unbecoming. I am doing, I am saying... I know I was right, and that's good enough for me. There are a whole lot of people. There's one person who, out of curiosity, I went and looked. They uh, deleted a bunch of their tweets defending Jacob Truba. So to tell you, to go from vehemently defending the helmet throw as something that turned the tide of the entire season to deleting your tweets about how important the helmet throw, that's enough for me. Yeah, I know I was right. I don't need to do I told you so. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that sucks about this. Why would I want to be right about this? I, I would rather be wrong. <laughs> I just want to win the cup. Like, yeah, I I will take being wrong all day, every day. Let me be wrong about everything. I just want a cup win. I just want I just want that one. Let me be wrong. I don't care. Hey, I just I just want them to go all the way and win. Andrew, I have one more question for you before we get out of here. I'm listening. But guys, are the Rangers fast enough? Uh, that'll do it. Yeah, that'll do it for this week's episode of the Liberty Blue Podcast. Make sure you are subscribed wherever you get your podcasts or over on YouTube. If you are watching over on YouTube, let us know who you want exiled off the island. Like if we had a catapult at South Ferry and we could shoot someone off of it towards Ellis Island and the Statue of Liberty, who would you want on the catapult? Let us know. We'll talk to you guys real soon. Until then, <sighs> fuck.